Um, oh yeah, there we go. Um, see if I can also oh, minimize this, cut it out of the way a little bit, maybe that one. There we go. Right. So yeah, we pick up from where we left off last week. Uh, I'd introduced that um, Docker is a, a framework somewhat similar to Git in the way that Git. Um, hello. Yeah, yeah Git, Git uh, is really for sort of um, s source code and projects, uh, whereas uh, Docker is is for applications. So what I'm going to be going through this this week is we Flask is something that Harry and I stumbled across, which is a really neat way to take um, if you if you can do any sort of scripting in Python, you can turn that into a web app really really easily. Uh, and that web app just using Flask will run on your local machine, which isn't much use for a web app really. So uh, in combination with this thing uh, that's pronounced Engine X, um, you can you can run alongside it a little simple web server, which means that if if your um, PC is is on the internet and has a publicly available uh, IP address, people can then access your little web server and uh, use use your Python script. So there's going to be an example of that, and that's the thing that uh, Harry was Harry was working on. And the way that um, you can deploy such a thing so that you yourself could uh, install it on a web server remotely, or if you wanted to share it as, as we can do today, so you'll you'll have that option to download it. Uh, you can put the whole thing up on, on GitHub and you can just download into a folder, run a simple Docker compose command, and it will produce the both of the images, the Flask and the Nginx image, and it will start them off in a way that they can talk to each other, uh, almost like magic. Um, so that, that's sort of one side of today's presentation. It's really in two parts. The second thing is that um, Docker Run is a, it, it, it runs pre, uh, pre prepared images. And I have pre prepared an image so we can do this in, in real time. And it really is as simple as just typing the run command, the name of the image you want to run, and any switches which tell it to link to local directories, expose ports so that you can use various things. I'll go into that in more detail later. And the, the single image that I just uh, was talking about, I'll quickly explain how I built it. And I didn't use best practice, uh, not least because a single container is really only supposed to run a single application. And you, what you would do, going back to last week's um, analogy of a restaurant where you pick your meal from a from a menu and then you have a table with your plate on it, you, the whole meal actually consists of lots of different plates. Um, but what I've done is I've made one image which is really simple to download and contains everything, sort of not breaking rules, but breaking conventions. But uh, we can have a discussion about whether we think that was a good idea later. Um, so uh, Harry's app in the um, in the chat last week, he put up a link to uh, a website where he had found this this guy who's doing amazing stuff. I'll, I'll go to this uh, website right away. OK, so this is uh, this isn't his website. This is where I've shamelessly taken his code and I just sort of he, he'd done it in a rather peculiar way. Uh, the whole idea of a Flask web app is that when you uh, on your your browser, they're always accessed through what well, they usually access through browsers. When you go to the site, it serves you up the web page that you then interact with. But he'd he'd done it in a sort of curious um, front end, back end sort of way. But I've I've done it after looking into Flash to see how it sort of works. I've well not Flash, sorry, Flag. I keep saying uh, Flask. Yeah. Um, so having having looked into it, I, I've sort of modified it a little bit. But this guy, uh, all credit to him, definitely worth visiting his stuff. He's got all sorts of um, image processing stuff, and just just he's on a on a different level, and he's very very keen to share, which is great. And he he's put this uh, link uh, to the uh, YouTube video that inspired him, and it's a very very good video and it explained to me how, how all this stuff works so I'm really just passing on that information now so this is what a um 
uh, let me let me just think for a moment. So what? Yeah. So this what what you're looking at here is Docker Compose. So there was Docker, which you can just run images um, and do all sorts of other things. But Docker Compose uh, will, if we look inside it, what it'll do is it can it'll build this flask image and it will build the nginx image and it will link them together on on ports uh, and finally right at the bottom here nginx will expose port 80 which is your standard um web page port so well we'll see how that works in a minute so so this is this is uh, very important the docker compose and in each of the two uh, applications. So they, these are two separate applications which are working in concert. They have their own Docker file. So you could build them independently and then you could work out how they're supposed to interact, but that's what the uh, what the Docker YML file is for. So just quickly look in this Docker file and this is based, they all follow the same sort of, well it's, it's a protocol, uh, so where it says here from <coughs> NGINX, what this means is there is already on Docker Hub an image called NGINX and it downloads that image and then all it does actually is change the configuration, that changes the default configuration into this custom configuration. So really almost no changes at all to NGINX. Uh, Flash, uh, Flask on the other hand is very much more like when we work in um, environments within Anaconda. So the app itself is in here where it says app and all of the Python, the whole thing is in this Python file. So if you can write a script to Python, you can basically use this as a template to drop your own Python in here and it will work just the same way. So uh, let's quickly look at the Python and what what this Python does is it's um, the same sort of well in fact this was on a, um, a Jupyter notebook and it, and it works in the same way you you import loads of stuff uh, you'll see so, it, so all of these libraries are going to need to be available to the Python when it runs and you'll see how it gets hold of those in a little while and just like with any good Python it's broken down into uh, Function, uh, functions, yeah, functions. So, and so there's a function, there's a function, there's a function. But what's very clever is that some of them, so here we get to actually sort of run the code. Some, then this function has got what's called a decorator, uh, this little at sign at the beginning. And what this means is you can either access this function in the normal Python way by calling it, or if you're on a web browser and you point your web browser to the IP address of where this thing lives, if it's on your own local computer, that will be localhost. Um, what what it will do uh, is so it, it will serve up. Uh, it'll return render template index.html. Well, template is in the templates folder. There's index.html. So this will be sent back to your browser. And as your browser's loading index.html, the code in that will be looking for CSS uh, for layout, and it will be looking for images uh, to, to load to make the web page look pretty. And those will be found in this folder called static. So in assets, there'll be a few pictures, and you'll see those when we run the run the application. Uh, and CSS, if anybody's done any web design, it's it's all to do with how things appear laid out on the page, fonts and and so on. So yeah, so so uh, when you if you if you just go to the basic website, you get the page handed to you. Uh, you could, if you knew about this secret switch called test, you could do test, and what all that would happen is your browser that would then say testing, testing. But here's the meat of it. Predict is so get uh, in in HTML world you have get and post. Get usually just means get a get a web page. Post means if there was some sort of form on that web page, you post that information back to the web server. And when it comes in, uh, it you, it tell you know your form would say post it to in this case predict 
And what's it going to post? Well, it's going to post uh, an image that's been selected from your hard drive. Uh, or your phone, as it turns out, on a on a mobile device. And the first part of this code is simply uh, decoding the image, because <coughs> when you send an image through the Internet, you have to just break it up into a string of bytes. And here it is, base 64 image, string of bytes, and you, you decode it. And then image is an image just as much as if you had selected something, something .jpeg. And this, this code then does the image processing, calls, calls the model and does the prediction and then what it does is it uh, it responds and the response in this case is just going to be look it says jsonify response uh, and the response is um the prediction the number number found and again you'll see that when the, when the thing's working so that's that's it in a nutshell uh, we're just basically looking at a a python Python application that's wrapped up in this flask, which makes it web accessible. And Nginx is going to be a web server running on our machine that makes it available from, from the outside. So how does this how does this work? Well, we can see if I can get back to my okay. Um, uh, Docker compose. Right. So how does it work? You you navigate, you you um, git clone it to a folder and then you run this command and I'll, I'll show you the folder where I did that and a very easy way to access it. So here's, uh, that isn't the folder where it is. I put mine in documents. Here are my GitHub projects. Here's the one that I just Git uh, cloned earlier. And inside here, you'll see this is basically what we've just been looking at on the website and there's Docker Compose. So you need to work from within this folder. So the, the, the really easy way to do that is just to click here, highlight everything and type CMD. And that brings you up a command window that's actually already in that folder. I could have typed all of this, <laughs> you know, CD all of this and got here, but much easier way to do it. Um, so if if I was wanting to build it and I don't want to build it, and the reason I don't want to is because it takes about half an hour. But when but <laughs> what that looks like, I'll just show you what happens as it's building. Uh, this is the sort of thing you would see. <coughs> and what takes a long time is that within this folder, it's got exactly the same thing that you would find if you were trying to run this in an environment in Anaconda. Uh, it's got a requirements.txt. So the first thing that happens, I will just look at this um, Docker file actually, because it's pretty interesting. So in this one, the Docker file's got a lot more in it. This one, uh, yeah, we can run it on there, but this one has got this from. So this is the base image. These these are all called layers. Uh, so, the, but the base image it starts from Python 3.7.2. So, if if you were in Anaconda land, you would build yourself an environment based on Python 3.7, and then you'll see it's got uh, it copies the, here. It's copying work directory and app, and, and in fact, at that point, it's copying the models that Harry trained into the application so that the Python can access it from inside the container. And then there's some version. We did have some problems with versions because things had changed over the three years. Uh, so it will be running uh, lots of pip installs. And finally, it will run the requirements.txt, which uh, will install all sorts of all sorts of good stuff, but take a very long time because it's installing things like PyTorch and OpenCV and so on. And uh, yeah, the, fi the final image is pretty, pretty big. So that's what's going on inside there. So if we go back to our command window, uh, I can type Docker compose. Now, if I were to type build, I don't want to do it. It would build just like you, you saw. It just takes a long time. It gives you it's really interesting to watch. But having built, uh, I what it will have done is it will have created two images. 
the engine X image and the flask image. And if they or if those images already exist, I can just type up, which will take from the images and put them into containers and run them. So here we go. Yeah, the only thing it's downloading for some reason in the um, Python script, it has to download this model ResNet 34. I don't know if that answers your <coughs> question about YOLO or not, um, Ed. But uh, anyway, so what happened? It, something's happened. Well, what's happened is it's created and started two containers here. So you can see them running away. Um, and you can see the output as it was going, load, lo loading PyTorch models, models loaded. This is all uh, stuff that was in the Python script, and it was just print, and we're seeing those print statements. So you can put lots of little debugs and things in for yourself. Well, what can it do? Well, this is what it can do. If we go to um, browser, if I now, oh, actually, yeah, if I now type, there's a problem on my thing. I'm going to type 127.0.0.1, which is also localhost. Uh, then what should happen is it loads the application. Um, yeah, so this is one of the pictures that was in that static folder. Uh, the If we looked at the page source, this would be the index.html that we just got served. And within the within the index.html, the browser tries to load look static CSS and the images and so on. And uh, and in fact, I think I mentioned that you could uh, do a test. So I think if I went one two seven dot zero dot zero dot one forward slash test, that will just run that little routine that said testing testing. So. OK, so there we go. And the, the way that this works is you submit an image. Uh, OK, is this an image? OK, so there's, is that my image? And then you click predict. And down here, you can see the interaction here where, um, well, it's, it's all very technical, but it, it's it's intercepting my requests. Uh, look here, here was that post predict look. So, so that post predict would have been sent to the Python. Uh, <coughs> I'm not seeing it sending any answer back. Okay, well, let's just try again. Might be an issue. Uh, submit image, pick this image, open and predict. Hopefully, and then it comes back with uh, with a number. Uh, and yeah, uh, there's not much more to say about that. This all it it knows. You can see in here that my browser is a uh, Chrome browser. Uh, if I went to it from my phone, uh, it would know that I was on an Android, for example, or whatever. And the, the that's that's why we use the Nginx. It's clever enough to be able to. Uh, work out what to do. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, this is obviously just running on my computer. You can't access this because it's not on a web server, but I also have it running at home. Um, so if you go to hff.hot2.org, um, that's my home computer and exactly the same thing is running. So this is now. Uh, don't know if it's more. This is more likely to fail because the image has to actually go up through the internet and through my ropey um, home network. Oh no, <laughs> Davin said that it works just as well as the local machine. So yeah, so that's the idea. So this is a proper internet application, and if you were to go to that on your phone, it would also work on your phone. Hopefully, if not, you just have to reload and predict a second time. It's a little bit flaky. Um, yeah, so that's that in a nutshell. Uh, let's just go back to. Um, uh, I think this is where we were from the current slide. Um, oh no, this is where we were. Yeah, so you've seen uh, running Docker, Docker Compose from within the from within the file and the application is now available 
and there you go uh so i i made my own image uh and i based it on the r studio there's a there's a project called rocker uh which is the r studio docker image and uh, they've got various ones but um I, I instead of making myself a Docker file like we saw that the other guy had done uh, and put from, you know, our studio image, whatever it was called, and then built a load of stuff on after that. I was lazy. What I did is I I ran their image and then I installed a load of stuff into it and. Uh, and then I froze the image in a similar sort of way to how you would download, you would clone a, um, a GitHub project, make some changes, commit and send back. Well, I, I've done the sort of same thing, but within uh, within Docker. And what, what I've added to it, um, not everybody will know what this is, but this DSAT 48 <coughs> is a, a crop uh, modeling tool. And it's really only available for Windows, um, but the guys behind it have put up the source code in Fortran <laughs> uh, in, a, in a Git repository and um, with some very clear instructions. So I just followed their instructions. Uh, I Git cloned it into my image, uh, compiled it, uh, did loads of stuff with permissions and stuff, put it into the R Studio server home directory and um and that 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 worked fine but i found it was all a little bit clunky to use potentially for uh, a novice so i wanted to add a desktop because of course most containers are just running the background doing their thing you don't normally interact with them in a in a gooey sort of way but that's exactly what we want to do so i added uh, a desktop environment i've added a browser a web browser within the um container and of course how how on earth do you access that well i also added a vnc server so that you've got a graphical entry point to the to the container and i i think demonstrating is probably the easiest way to explain this so if you want to do this you can do this you obviously need docker desktop and then you would just run uh doc oops uh run the command there it would in your in your case, since you don't have the image on your machine, the first thing that run does is pull. In fact, it will pull the image, then it will run it. And um, you can see that the image that I've modified and pushed uh, back to Docker Hub, I've called it on the sofa, Harrog underscore workspace, and that's a naming convention. So all of my stuff starts with on the sofa, and then you can you can find that you can just you know in the search within the public area of uh, the Docker GitHub, uh, the Docker Hub. So and when, once it's run, uh, you access it through your browser or through a. Uh, a VNC viewer. Not everybody would have used a VNC viewer, so I have got some instructions on how to install one. But I'll show you actually working in Anger first. So, so first of all, I'm going to run this code in a command window. In this case, it doesn't matter where that command window is. It only matters that the Docker engine is running, and the Docker engine will be running if your Docker Hub, uh, your Docker desktop, is running. So. I'll start a command prompt in the normal way. And then I will copy this instruction and I'll explain. It looks like a scary instruction, but actually uh, each part of it's very easy to understand. And you don't even have to use this. You can also do this from uh, Docker desktop. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that in a moment. <coughs> but here's the here's the hardcore way. You just paste that in. And oh, it's running already. OK, so there it is. So that's just started straight up. I've got an image on my hard disk already. Yours will take some time to download four gigs worth of image. Uh, but once it's once you've done it once, it will start up this quickly. Well, what started up? Uh, let's have a look. If we go into containers, we can see we've now got uh, this image running 
it it names them all these wacky things if you don't give it a name uh epic jennings <laughs> for whatever reason and you can see that it's exposed ports 59 uh, to 5901, or it's mapped the ports from the inside of the container to the outside world. So 5900 is the default port actually for VNC. And uh, it's also mapped 8787. So let's have a look at 8787 first. So if we go to uh, localhost, and then you put in a port like this. So if you don't put anything, that just takes you to the root of the web application. But in this case, we want to go to 8787 because that's where our studio have put themselves. And we're now into our studio. This is the username. The password is the password that uh, was in that long string command. And when you go in, this will immediately be hopefully familiar to everybody on the Harper Adams R user group. Just takes a minute to load and there we are. So you've basically got yourself um, R Studio and it does everything that you might imagine R Studio would. Um, the only caveat really is that if you put anything into, if you create a folder, if I create a new folder now and call it um, uh, Wednesday. And if I was to put it, I can use this, I can use it all day long. But if I, when this container is destroyed, that's gone. It's, 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 it's you'll never see it again. Uh, but what I have done is I've put in, again, in that long command, a mapping. So there's a shared directory um, into here, actually, something I was testing with uh, Shemek. We git from within here, we git cloned his. Um, his repository and just run it, no problem. So you can do this from the terminal. So you've got, look, we're in a, it, the whole thing is basically a Linux computer with our studio server installed and we're accessing it through our browser. And for the most part, that's absolutely fine. Um, if that isn't enough, what you can actually do is you can use a, uh, VNC viewer and what this does is it gives you uh, access to virtual desktops so I can I can close this now so the image or the container rather is sitting there it's running away quite happily but I'm not accessing it I've got no window into the container but if I go to localhost and click on there voila this is the inside of the container running in a desktop environment uh, on VNC and I can do things like so home because I'm our studio I can go in there sure enough look here's my shared folder so the reason you might want to come in here is because it's got a much nicer uh, file manager than than our studio um, the other reason you might want to come in here is uh, that it's also got a much nicer terminal and you can do pretty much anything. It's it, uh, use it, use it to learn Linux. It's a you know it's a Linux an indestructible Linux machine. Uh, and the other thing you can you can do everything from within here is you can launch a browser within the uh, terminal, make it bigger. And now because we're inside the container, if I go to uh oh uh oh. Give it a second. Yeah, so if I go to localhost from. What's it doing? Local host. I don't know why it's running so slow. Uh, OK, so localhost, uh, same thing. Uh, 8787. Run it. Not sure why this is running so slow. Possibly something to do. Uh, <laughs> not sure what's happened here. Okay, hang on. Uh, I'm just going to close my virtual viewer 
I'm just going to see whether the container is actually still running successfully by going back to localhost 8787. Mm, seems not, and my computer is making a lot of noise. Uh, not sure why that is. OK, well, I mean, it's not the end of the world, so I can show you some of the other thing. Oh. It's interesting. That's got uh, so I can show you. That was the uh, running on the local. VNC viewer, I'll find out why that isn't working again in a minute. Uh, this is how you would install your standard VNC viewer. I've given you the link. Make sure you select standalone because you don't need to install the server and everything into your system. Uh, and when you run it, it's going to desperately try to get you to sign up and create an account. You don't need to do that either. Um, and these are the login details. So the RStudio, when you launch it from the browser, is RStudio uh, is the username and Harper. The VNC is just Harper. And uh, there's your, your mapping, uh, your mapped folder. So make sure you work in the mapped folder. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to <laughs> stop and restart the container. Um, so what I'll probably do is delete it and rerun it. So let me just quickly explain a little bit in the Docker run uh, here. So run is the run command, which also pulls. Uh, this just means these are switches. This means it's interactive, uh, which basically means that when it's running, you keep the command window up and it uh, gives you some information about what's happening. Minus V is, is volume. So what it's saying is create a volume, which is this one on the local drive and this one on the Linux drive. Uh, and you can change these. You can set them to whatever you like, you, as you can also change the password for the RStudio to whatever you like. And minus P is the port mapping. So 8787 is what the R server runs on and it's mapped from the inside to the outside on the same port number. This this is slightly different. So the host, it's always host first, followed by container. So this is the standard port for whoops, for VNC. 5901 is because in the particular VNC server we're using in the Linux, it can do multiple desktops and it, it, it labels the first one one, the second one two, and so on. So we actually did need to change the mapping there. And that finally, that, that's just the name of the um of the image that we're 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 running. So let's let's go to here and see if we can fix what's gone wrong. I don't like the fact my fan's on something, so something's not running quite right. So this isn't this. Let me just check. It's definitely not running. OK, so. Let's see if we can fix it. I'm just going to. I'm not even going to try attempt to stop it. You can stop and restart using this button. Um, I've noticed that when you do that, the VNC server doesn't restart, and I do know why, but it's it's not. I'm not going to bother with it just at the moment because it's very easy just to do that. Make sure it's the container you're deleting and not the image. Uh, deleting. OK, it looks like uh, Docker itself is frozen, actually. <coughs> OK, let's try a different way. Um, Let's just close this. And yeah, let's close that. And uh, can even close that. That's my um, web, you know, the little wheat counter thing. Just try to give it one more chance to close. OK, so in fact, Docker, Docker, this this thing itself is failed. It's not. It's not my doing. Let's just relaunch it. So. Let's just go to here to Docker. Desktop.
And what should happen, it should come up first, tell you that it's starting the engine, which is the underlying uh, guts of it. And then it should come up with the desktop itself. OK, mm, OK, well, it didn't show me that the engine was starting, but let's have a, have a look. So containers, OK, the containers have gone. Uh, the images, <laughs> OK, so it's showing me that I haven't got the images and, and actually I have. Um, so, yeah, I'm probably going to have to restart my computer or something because Docker desktop is just not not playing game. Uh, and I can check that by if I go to CMD type Docker. Yeah, it's just fallen over, I guess. Um, oh, OK. Why is this not? Containers, images, no. OK, I think we'll have to leave it there. Um, I would have to restart my computer and restart Docker desktop. Uh, well, I'll just quickly show you a command line or two. Um, I don't expect them to work because the Docker desktop isn't working, but you can do Docker list, uh, Docker image list. List. Uh, and again, it's not working. So this should list all of the images that are there. You can do a similar thing with containers. You can remove containers. You can start containers and stop containers. But um, this has actually uh, died, unfortunately, on my on my system. Um, Matt, right, can I ask so, you a question at this juncture? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, so I was going to stop sharing at this point and. Um, uh, just one more thing uh, is that we can uh, on this VNC. Um, you see, I've got hop2.org here. If I run that, uh, and and anybody who's got VNC can also do this simultaneously. Um, okay, Harper, if you remember, was the what's the name? So here, here's where we were when it all went um, when it went funny. Has anybody else got VNC and could just confirm that they're also able to reach this? Not set up right now to do it. Nobody else? OK. Um, OK, but what, I'll just continue the demo, actually, this one. This, so this is this is working uh, hey, remotely. Can I ask a question before? Yeah, you of course you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is um, <clears throat> when you're messing around with this and you've been learning about it, mm. how stable is uh, is your average Docker container? The, that's the first time it's crashed, and I don't think it's the fault of the container. I think it's uh, the the laptop I'm running it on, possibly uh, because I've got you know PowerPoint and um, Team Viewer and you know and 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 running on it. I don't know, but this one that's running at home. Uh, if I just quickly show you something, uh, oh, I can't show you something, but this is um, this has been running for days. Uh, this, I mean, th these dates are from when I um, downloaded the stuff from Shemek last night. I was trying out his uh, his stuff. So, yeah, but no, generally, generally very stable, um, amazingly stable. So it's the Docker runtime that has crashed on my computer. It's not uh, it's not a fault of the container you know, itself. Yeah, it's not a fault of Docker itself. I wouldn't like to give docker a bad reputation just because that's happened uh, yeah where are we i'm just trying to stop sharing the screen now uh, i'll find the button in a minute i don't know if i quite caught it is you're going okay. quite fast there yeah um, is um so the stocker container with dsat <clears throat> you can you can set it up with input files you can upload input files probably uh well i mean yeah, yeah i mean the, the 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 proper probably way to do it is to you you've got this shared folder if you run the command as is in the powerpoint it will set up <coughs> assuming you're on windows it will set up a folder on your c drive called harug mm -hmm. uh there's a correspond it will set up a corresponding folder on within the r studio called shared and those two things are synchronized. So you can externally, you could, um, if you've got GitHub desktop running on your Windows PC, 
you could get down into that folder or you could copy anything you liked into that folder in any way at all and it will appear in the R studio if the R if you you know if, if you have a disaster in the R studio breaks or whatever it doesn't matter Every, everything's still on in that folder and you, when you relaunch the image into a new container it's all still there i see what the <clears throat> d set is a bit of a weird one for for this it seems like a complicated thing do, do you think that's true or is that just my perception uh... it's, it's it, I don't, no i don't think it is complicated uh complicated because um what i did was well let me uh i will just quickly share my screen again and show you what was involved in setting up mm. um DSA and and how it's used so i see uh so okay i'm sharing again so i'm going to my one that's running successfully at home uh, I'm on the desktop, so I can just close this R Studio. That's fine. So in the file system uh, down here, uh, you'll see somewhere. Here we go. Look. So here, this this folder was Git cloned from, um, you know, the the DSAT Federation, whatever it's called. This is the data. They they did it in two two tranches, if you like. Um, and the, the data that is in here, you have to manually copy into uh, the data folder in here, which I've done. But when you when you compile it using their instructions, so I you know I compiled it by having a you know a line running here type all the uh, you know make directory build uh, c make dot dot and all the the usual thing when you build a thing from source from the internet and the the outcome was that in the build folder it creates this which is equivalent to uh, the the .exe that you get in windows the one that um Shemek and George have been using and what i did is i then made a copy of this whole folder and i stuck it in the r studio uh home location which is stroke home stroke r studio and there it is dsat 48 so in here you've got uh you've got all your standard this is you know this is a virgin installation of dsat as as the makers intended uh and in there is uh a copy of the executable uh lots of files that it needs to run um it's got a it's got an explanation here of the data structure and whatnot that came down with it. But when we're in, so to run something in our studio, this is this is this is how you do it. And in fact, I put a, a little example script. It's very very simple. Uh, Local host eighty eight seven. Sign in. So let's just close this. In fact, so so run D set example. So what you do is you uh within dsat here so this this in linux terms means home directory it means that we're basically here uh it says uh within the dsat 48 folder go to maze so there's a folder in there called maze and within the maze is this experiment uh and what you do is you <coughs> you use a system command from within our studio to run the dsat executable uh and and then it runs so so to run it it's, it's literally this run and that's it mm. that, that ran that experiment shemek's uh, work is obviously much <laughs> much more involved with that but so here is in the shared folder this is his um uh this is his thing and in the scripts folder is uh i hope show it doesn't mind me running this he's uh, he's written a load of scripts and and it's based on stuff george did as well so shout out to george um so we did one called dsat pipeline um and then you just source this whole folder and it runs through uh you know it's it's scripts calling scripts calling scripts you know getting the weather getting the soil and so on but importantly at some point it this these scripts create the experiment file using the uh, dsat library the dsat editor and then uh, that's just fed to a command line 
uh, uh, just just start scribing and then there we go it's run so this is going to run a series of experiments in fact but uh, yeah so that that's um that's it so my my only I, I think i can guess what you're sort of hinting at my my next step was to think how to put a nice front end onto this and get the user data into it that's the yeah uh, that's the difficulty yeah yeah drop yeah. the data can I... upload here oh, oh George. On, George. Yeah, sorry guys. Um, basically, you know how when you have a Git folder and you put in the Git ignore, so it doesn't save any kind of information from that run. It, um, I'm sorry if yeah. I missed something here, but yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that the same with the Docker? So like if I ran it and then she logged on, would he have the same runs that I've just done or? No, no, he would say, no, you would have completely separate uh, installations. Um, ah, okay, the, yeah, the only way really you good. could you could synchronize with Shimek would be through GitHub. <coughs> so you would okay. each clone. You would each clone. In fact, Jim and I did this the other day. He he had a version. I had a version. And I wanted to make a change so that it would run either on Windows or in this R Studio. So I branched. I did yeah. a branch, made my changes, uh, pushed them up, and then Jimek merged them into the main thing. And if you download Jimex uh, repository now, that's what you get. So it will either run just on plain old Windows or it will run in this environment. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. It would be nice to have the capability to have a have a container. I, I think what you've shown us and told us is that this is probably pretty easy to do. But the catch is that the user would need to, uh, you'd want the user to be able to upload the experiment parameters, mm -hmm. the field model, yeah, and, al and also upload um, a few other files like the plant location file, the stem number. Exactly. So if you imagine um, the, the first half of this thing was that wheat counter, which was a Python web app. But that had you, you saw that that had a button on it where you select an image and then you push upload. Well, yeah. think of that on steroids with, you know, a form where you input various bits of data and then submit. It submits, it then runs the script and then outputs back to the web page. Yeah. That's, That's great, Matt. It's r really good. Uh, I think it's fascinating. Um, do, can you think of other applications for this right away? Or will you be using this? Um, well, not, uh, will I be using it? <laughs> I <don't, laughs> uh, well, not, no, not. Uh, I can't think of anything immediately. I mean, I, it's used in, you know, like on the NVIDIA Jetsons. Yeah. Um, when you run those jet packs and you, all those examples for different uh, machine learning techniques, they've got Docker containers for that. And you can just go Docker run. And, you know, do you want to do segmentation? Do you want to do uh, classification, object did detection? This, did you run this something like this when you, let's say the, the automated moth trap, where yeah. you have an image, you wait 10 minutes, but in that 10 minutes, you could you could run a detection model and count up the the moths in each of your pictures, and overnight on the same uh, microcontroller that's grabbing the the um, the images on the automated moth trap, you're actually collecting the data and running the uh, predictions. Uh, yeah, I think the way that I would do it is to have the um, run a Flask application that posted that that posted the images so have python monitor for you know the image cha a change in a folder oh there's a new image and have that post that image to another container running in a server uh online to to either just uh well to to do the some sort of prediction or curate them or, or whatever i guess i was thinking of uh I don't know. I'm trying to think of like where would you really get a big benefit from using this with the kind of stuff that you work on and that that I work on, and like maybe maybe if you had the automated moth trap, the benefit of this is that you could have the 
as you said, you could move the pictures to the cloud. Yeah. Do, I mean, do, it's really, it's about it's about deployment. I mean, if you're just doing one yeah. thing for yourself, there's kind of no point containerizing that. Well, I'm I'm <laughs> thinking of having. What if you had multiple moth traps deployed in the field? Oh yeah, and, yeah. And then you'd you'd have a way to well, analyze well, the, it and the look joy, at the, the joy results. would be uh, here. Here's a really good example. Let's say you'd got loads of moth traps deployed, and you'd got obviously an internet connection to them, and then you thought, oh shit, my program's wrong. Well, all you, uh, you could have the program running in a container. You can just update the container, uh, go in and say, download the new container and run uh, that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yes. for edge for edge computing, it's it's awesome. Okay. Yeah, and so, and I was sort of thinking about um, uh, you know, like when you do your um, our boot camp. I know that half the fun is getting the students to install. R and R Studio and yeah. all that stuff, um, but maybe it would be easier if you just said, "Go to this web address and here's your R Studio ready to run." Yeah, I don't know. And then everybody's on the same version, and nobody's wasting hours and hours trying to install a, a library that won't, you know, is incompatible. Or... Yeah, yeah. Everybody's yeah. That would save some problems, even for yeah, teaching one class a year. But I can think of some applications for it for, yeah, for devices on the edge. I think that's a good use case for it. Mm. I, I really like the use of you're having a server. It's a cheap server that, you know, you can kind of hack together in a sense. You've got a mm. tool in there like yeah, a yeah. detection well, model. It's, it's really good. I mean, using that wheat uh, counter example, yeah. I've just installed it on my local machine and I also yeah. installed it on my home machine. But if I if I had rented a web space, as it were, a server in the cloud, uh, how do I put my stuff on there? The easiest yeah. way is to test everything out on my computer, go up, put it into GitHub, then then SSH into my GitHub, into my server, Git clone it, Docker, um, what was it? Docker compose. That's it. I'm done. Yeah. I'm deployed. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Um, all right. We're, I think we're going to have to keep thinking about this technology. I think it's great. Uh, I'm interested in using it with the edge devices and maybe uh, maybe a computer vision model will be the next one to test. Yellow V8, it's got a Docker mm -hmm. installation. I'll think mm -hmm. about how we can use it for our. Mm -hmm. um, I, we will keep talking about how we can use it for DSAT and the whole pipeline. I don't know if we get a lot of bang for the buck out of that if they're going to do their own thing, which might well, be. Well, no, that, that's right. It's, that was sort of taken away from us. Really. Yeah. But, um, well, thanks. But you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or uh, comments from anyone? Well, just a comment that uh, perhaps uh, the mm, Tuberscan partners are taking the Tuberscan thing from us, but there's still some potentially some more um, um, crop modeling to be done. True. Yeah, that's true. We'll continue using it, and maybe this is this something like this that's containerized that we could deploy to a student because we have had some installation troubles on different laptops. So maybe that is a good use case for this.